I lived in Queen's Meadow, Cherry Hinson, there were three air raid shelters on the green. I also remember going down there in an air raid. Evelyn Oxby remembers there were two air raid shelters in the playing field at Cherry Hinton School on the High Street. We used to have air raid practice. Mr Bray, the headmaster, would stand in the playground and blow his whistle, and we would all file out and go down to shelters. When he blew it again, we would file back to class. Bill Chapman also remembers going to the air raid shelter at the junior school and putting his gas mask on, which he hated because he felt he couldn't breathe. Paul Holmes was at St Mary's Infant School in Ely. One day in the first week at school, each class had to assemble in the playground with their teacher and were led across the playground, through a gate, down a slope into what we now know was an air raid shelter. This procedure happened quite frequently, but never for real as we did not have any daytime air raids. I still don't think we understood exactly what was happening, but it was good fun. Sue Kitchen was at school at Milton Road School in Cambridge. She remembers that once or twice they went to the shelters at the football city ground next to the school during an air raid. She says it was quite a trek. Jack Green remembers his first air raid when at school in Sleaford, Lincolnshire. We fled to the shelter and the teacher had a wind-up gramophone and we all sang to it until the all clear went. Sheila Beck in Peterborough remembers one night. I heard the seemingly endless drone of wave after wave of the engines of heavy bombers overhead on their way to bomb Coventry as I learnt later. About this time I as a little girl realised that things could drop out of the sky and kill me. A frightening realisation. Outside our house in Peveril Road was a brick air raid shelter. There were shelves for bunk beds but we didn't use the shelter much. We tended to stay at home and hope for the best. Paul Holmes remembers. When I came home from school one day, I found that a Morrison's air raid shelter had been constructed in our living room. This was a steel cage with a solid steel top, and it was to be mine and my brother's for the rest of the war. Also, when the siren sounded, our neighbour used to bring her son to our house and put him in our bed with us. Maureen Gibbs, living in Ipswich, remembers the sirens and the sound of the planes and a rush to the air raid shelter. Soldiers came to dig and erect the shelters for women on their own or the elderly. One time when the sirens came, instead of going down to the shelter, Mum had put a large eider down under the bed. We slept on it with another cover over us. The bed was quite high with large springs and the bedding on top of it. There we were, supposedly trying to sleep, when Auntie cried out, Lily, they've got me, they've got me. When we looked, she had her hair caught in the bed spring. Of course, she'd been dreaming. Susan Green in Sleaford remembers the siren going, situated on top of the town hall. Mum and I hid under the dining table. Sue Kitchen's main memories of World War II are of the shelters we used mostly at the beginning of the war. The dugout at the bottom of the garden, going down in our nightwear plus blankets. Also, the ugly Morrison shelter which took the place of the table in our dining room. Gwen Wesley was in the ATS and stationed at Malvern with the Royal Engineers. Gwen worked in the officer's mess as a waitress. Everything was tip top. The officers gave their clothing coupons so the waitresses could have a special uniform, a pale blue dress with white collars and cuffs. Gwen remembers VE Day well. She said people had been through so much with the bombing. The worst time was the bombing. It was such a hard war, everyone was so pleased it was over. Normally waitresses were not allowed to fraternise with the officers, but Gwen says, we did on VE Day. We all let go of the rules. Everyone was so happy kissing each other. Normally there was not so much alcohol available, but there was on VE Day, and everyone got tipsy and went to dance together. In the morning, we had to get up and not fraternise with the men we had been kissing the night before. Gwen says it was one of the best days of her life. Paul Holmes, chairman of the RBL was a schoolboy in Ely during the war. I remember VE Day 1945 very well. Our street held a party in the field close to my parents' home. The farmer who owned the field brought his donkey to the party to give rides to the children. My brother climbed into the saddle but the donkey wouldn't move. The farmer slapped the donkey on the backside. The donkey bolted and my brother fell off and broke his arm, which meant he missed the party and instead had to take a trip to the hospital in Cambridge. Sheila Beck was a child in Peterborough. On VE Day we had a street party in Peveril Road with trestle tables for the food and everyone in fancy dress. Everybody contributed and it seemed a huge amount of food after all the rationing. 
It was a lovely surprise when sweets and chocolate came back into the shops, but they were still on the ration for another 10 years. Later, bananas were available, at first in the dried form, which I didn't like, but then I tried the real ones. They were a real treat. Jill Mallet was a young child living in Norwich. In 1944, we moved to Norwich to a big neglected house with a garden of an acre. Here we played and I took credit for organising a huge bonfire with an effigy of Hitler on the top for VE Day. It was dramatic as we children had worked very hard collecting wood and leaves to burn. It was so successful that it was repeated for VJ Day later in August. <laughs>